Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing the PlayStation 5 Deep Dive by Mark Cerny. So I hope you're all having an amazing day, because we have a lot to talk about here. In this video, I want to focus just as an overview of the PlayStation 5 specs. In a future video, I'll dive deeper and go into the underlying technologies and how they compare against Microsoft's offerings. But going into the event, I do feel that a lot of people had, quite frankly, unrealistic expectations, with so many expecting a whole blowout of PlayStation 5 information, potentially even the price. And this, to me, wasn't quite realistic. After all, this conference was essentially intended for developers. It was an evolution of sorts to what Sony had originally planned at GDC. With that said, I do wish that we'd have seen some gameplay demos, or at least some graphics demos, of what the PS5 is capable of. As it stands, I was a little disappointed with the Xbox for limited demos, but this is even further accentuated with the PlayStation 5. I'm not saying that I expected... Sony to reveal every single game it was working on, but just a few short snippets to kind of highlight some of its points would have been rather nice. So, what about the specifications of the machine itself? Um, well, there is an awful lot to go through here. So, starting out with the CPU, there are 8 Zen 2 processor cores running at 3500MHz variable frequencies. I'll discuss uh, variable frequency in just a moment. But, uh, there was no mention, unlike Xbox, whether SMT could be disabled. So, for this video, I'll assume that SMT is always enabled for the PlayStation 5, and developers cannot uh, opt to disable it for ease of porting game engines. The memory is 448GB per second of memory bandwidth, with 16GB of GDDR6 on a 256-bit bus. Honestly... That's exactly what I expected. I kind of was between 448 gigabytes per second and 512 gigabytes per second based upon several leaks and also the GitHub results. With GH, um, we'd seen certain results at 512 gigabytes per second, but also quite a few at 448 gigabytes per second. But the CPU, just going back for a moment, this clock frequency is pretty much in line with what I expected. I didn't really think that there was going to be much between the Xbox and the PlayStation, being honest. I kind of figured that they were going to be essentially interchangeable. So the GPU then is 36 compute units, which is, of course, identical to GitHub. Uh, so no real surprise there, but what is different is that the clock frequency has been cranked up it's actually 10% higher than what we saw from the GitHub results, so it's 2,230 megahertz, meaning that the, in terms of T-flops, it's 10.28 at peak. I'll get into, once again, the peak uh, asterisk in just a moment. However, it is a custom RDNA 2-based design. Once again, something that I was almost certain of. Not only because uh, Sony themselves had mentioned technology like foveate rendering in several patents, but we'd also, of course, seen Mark Cerny himself multiple times push the fact that there was hardware-based ray tracing on the GPU. But it had also been kind of whispered to me that Sony were using a custom variant of the um, technology. And I'd also mentioned that according to a couple of people that I've been hearing through through the grapevine, RDNA 2 and AMD's roadmap at large had been actually quite influenced by um, both Sony and Microsoft. And actually Cerny himself, during the conference, essentially put that point forward. That while AMD had been extremely great in actually creating features for RDNA 2 and for, of course, its later GPUs, they do have significant insight into one another. So, of course, it's a symbiotic relationship. So if something works really great for the console, it makes logical sense, therefore, to bring it into the PC domain. Because why wouldn't you? I'm, I'm going over an older point I made in a, a video a couple of days ago. I'll try to remember to link it in the description of the video. But essentially, even things like when the PlayStation 4 launched, we saw an increased uh, number of uh, asynchronous compute engines, which was something that 
AMD's older GPUs didn't have. And of course, AMD bought that technology into their um, R9-290, for example, which the actual architecture name just uh, gone straight off my noggin. But anyway, the fact of the matter is that there has been an awful lot of um, uh, symbiotic relationships between uh, AMD uh, and Microsoft and, of course, Sony in terms of uh, feature sets. So I was quite certain regarding RDNA 2. Um, and to this, mark, to this end, there is also a rather interesting new block, which is actually on the PlayStation 5 APU. And it's known as the Geometry Engine. Essentially, this kind of seems similar to primitive shaders that are basically mesh shaders on NVIDIA's Turing GPUs. And we actually know that that's part of the Xbox as well as AMD's upcoming second generation of RDNA himself. There are still a lot of questions exactly what the Geometry Engine, uh, how, excuse me, the Geometry Engine differs compared to the RDNA 2 implementation and, of course, the Xbox implementation. But the idea here is that you can essentially have an awful lot of control from developers over triangles, primitives, and geometry. Uh, especially, so, for example, if you don't want a triangle to be drawn after it's essentially started to be uh, rendered uh, because you've realized that it falls outside of the screen space or maybe it's obscured by something else. This makes it a lot easier to optimize for those scenarios. Furthermore, if it is anything like mesh shaders on Turing, we can also expect the GPU to be able to do things like render uh, objects which are, let's say, outside of... The main view focus, let's say for the sake of argument that uh, that object is being blurred, therefore they can render it at lower detail, which will also save an awful lot of performance. Although there are still an awful lot of questions we have regarding some of this technology. So while it wasn't implicitly stated that variable rate shading uh, is inside the GPU, given the fact that we have um, primitive shaders, it's logical that variable rate shading is implemented. But once again, um, there's still some questions there. But given that foveate rendering is also part of the GPU, I think it's quite logical that um, this is the case. Hardware ray tracing is also implemented on the GPU. And he doesn't really go that far into the ray tracing technology. It's more touched on uh, in terms of how it's implemented, unfortunately. What he did say, though, is it seems to be based on the same strategy as AMD's upcoming PC GPUs, which obviously nukes one of the earlier rumors that it was a separate chip on the APU. I'd said that I was extremely skeptical about this, mostly because of latency uh, but between rendering frames. I, I, I just didn't believe that that would be the case. And so you should be able to push stuff like ambient occlusion, shadows, global illumination, better reflections, and all of this other stuff. But of course, it will be down to developers to kind of figure out how to use that. According to Sony, an exact quote was, How far can we go? I'm starting to get quite bullish. I've already seen a PS5 title that is successfully using ray trace based reflections in complex animated scenes with only modest costs. Of course, when he refers here to modest costs, he is referring to frame rate. And that also extends rather well to the uh, RDNA 2 based GPU as well uh, from AMD later this year. It seems like RDNA 2 is going to be quite the beast. So getting back to the clock speed thing, and I mentioned a couple of times now that there are variable frequencies for both the CPU and GPU. So what gives? What exactly does it mean by variable frequency? Well, uh, a couple of days ago with the Xbox Series X reveal, I did speculate that I believe that the PlayStation 5's GPU at the very least could differ in terms of clock frequency. And there were a couple of reasons I speculated this. One, Microsoft's comments, quite frankly, uh, with the Xbox Series X, they consistently were pushing that the clock speed of the CPU and the GPU were locked. Um, and companies tend to not do that in isolation, because when it comes to a console, 
you expect locked frequencies. There are some exceptions to this rule, like, for example, the switch. The clock speed will differ depending on whether it's, uh, say, docked or undocked. But generally speaking, the PlayStation 4 G uh, GPU, for example, will always be 800 megahertz. Obviously, if the machine is overheating, that's a completely different topic. But consistently, the GPU clock frequency will remain consistent. However, according to Mark Cerny, this paradigm has been completely and utterly turned on its head. And now... I'm going to give a direct quote from Cerny. Rather than running at constant frequency and letting the power vary based on the workload, we run at essentially constant power and let the frequency vary based on the workload. End quote. So basically, inside the uh, APU, the workload of the CPU and GPU is consistently being analysed. So... This is further explained by Cerny when he says, and I quote, Rather than look at the actual temperatures of silicon dye, we look at the activity of the GPU and CPU are performing, and set frequencies on that basis, which makes everything deterministic and repeatable. While we're at it, we also use AMD's smart shift technology and send any unused power from the CPU to the GPU so it can squeeze out, quote, a few more pixels. End quote. This is actually, in my mind anyway, extremely fascinating for an approach. Uh, it's definitely very different than perhaps what you might have expected. And the smart shift idea, for those who are unfamiliar, you can actually do a Google, if you'd like, on Renault um, from AMD. And they actually showed this at their financial analyst day quite extensively, smart shift. What it basically means is if you're running a GPU-intensive application, for AMD anyway... The CPU will have a lower power envelope, and instead, that power will be transferred to the GPU. This is so that the uh, cooling solution doesn't have to worry about, essentially, dealing with more heat than it can possibly manage. But also, in some scenes, quite frankly, the GPU is the bigger bottleneck. So it's like, okay, let's just make up a scenario and say that the GPU is rendering at, just for sake of argument, 1800p at 60fps. This is not, by the way, insider information and saying that the PS5 can't hit 4K. I'm just making an easy scenario up. So let's say that that's the case. And then the CPU is like, mm, actually, I'm kind of not being fully taxed here. GPU, you might as well have this performance so that you can run and try to maintain the 2230 megahertz. So, of course, it will shift some of the power and uh, thermal budget, budget excuse me, to the uh, GPU, and it can run at higher clock frequencies. Thus, the internal rendered resolution should theoretically be a little bit higher. It's actually quite an ingenious solution by uh, Sony, and I find it very different to what Microsoft are doing, but... I don't think it's actually necessarily inferior, it's just quite different. But getting back to the elephant in the room that's just knocked over all of the China and then stamping in the China, the performance, the GPU between the Xbox and PlayStation, and I don't want to go into a full deep dive between them here, but I know invariably I'm going to get absolutely inundated with messages if I don't tackle this, so I'll quickly go into it. The architecture here is very different between the two. Basically, we knew from the GitHub results way back in the day, when they first leaked at the midpoint of last year, that um, there was a very good chance that the PlayStation 5 GPU was a lot narrower, 36 compute units, and of course at that point it was running at just 2 gigahertz, whereas with the uh, Xbox, it was instead running at uh, 2... Uh, sorry. I was about to say 2 gigahertz, which would be extremely impressive, but no, it was running at um, 1675 megahertz, but with 56 compute units active. I'm going to guess that there was only 56 uh, active on the die at maximum, but even with the early engineering samples, and therefore Microsoft smartly decided to go with a slightly lower number of compute units, 52, and crank the clock speeds up. And Clock frequency is just as imperative, just as important to performance as the number of compute units. So while the T-flop war 
Sony are definitely losing, it doesn't mean that Microsoft are going to have the advantage in every single scenario. Running the clock frequency of the GPU faster means that the GPU itself can actually do more work in some instances, and the caches, for example, of the GPU can actually be faster, which means that in some workloads, the PS5 GPU may be as fast as the Xbox. I'm going to do more research on this, and I'll be very fascinated to know uh, when we have further information, excuse me, of the RDNA 2 architecture, exactly how workloads and... Um, compute units and clock frequencies scale because at the moment we have quite a few guesses however i will say that the playstation 5's gpu should theoretically be a lot easier to saturate and i don't think it will be any form of slouch i think it will be extremely impressive and capable so then we'll leave that discussion for another time because this video is already getting a lot longer than I'd anticipated, to be honest with you. I seem incapable of brevity. I'm sure uh, I'm sure some of you are probably quite aware of that, painfully so by this point. But um, So let's talk instead about the SSD. Cerny himself pointed out that a request for an SSD was consistent for when he was basically shopping around asking for a wish list for the next generation consoles and obviously the great thing about ssds is they're much faster but this comes into two things one instantaneous access of any data because typically on a hard drive you've got seek times this is basically where the mechanical head of the drive needs to find the requisite piece of data on this spinning platter but then obviously when you found the data then you need to actually read it and pull it into system memory so SSDs are definitely a massive win there. They are much faster at pulling in data. Meanwhile, with the um, with uh, the negatives, they are obviously way more expensive, and this also means that to get larger drives, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. According to Mark Cerny, this SSD can pull in about two gigabytes of data on average. I'll get to the averages in just a moment. In a one quarter of a second. So the entire 16 gigabytes of the PlayStation 5's memory can be filled in just two seconds. So the SSD itself is 825 gigabytes. This is not accounting for how much space is taken up by the operating system. And speaking of reserves, we also don't know how much of the CPU is reserved for the OS, and we also don't know how much memory is reserved for the OS. If I had to take a guesstimate, I would say it's going to be one core, exactly like the Xbox, and it will be around 3 gigabytes of memory as well, reserved for the OS uh, that's the RAM, of course, but I'm basing this on the Xbox numbers and what was consistent with the last generation. So I could be totally off with that, and it could be, you know, 5% of a processor core. So don't quote me, I'm just guessing. But anyway, so 825 gigabytes of storage sounds kind of weird, and some people online are taking that as like 1 terabyte minus OS crap. Um, that's a technical term, OS crap. But this is not actually the case. It's just the way that NAND Flash actually works. So basically, there's 12 channel interface, and that basically divides itself perfectly with 825 gigabytes of capacity. Unsurprisingly, it is a PCI Express 4 interconnect and can support 5.5 gigabytes per second of raw speed. Now, the reason I'm stressing the word raw is because it's typically compressed data, which is handled by dedicated components on the SOC itself. And in terms of decompressing comp performance, it can be equated to 9 of their Zen 2 processor cores. This closely mirrors, by the way, what Microsoft said regarding the Xbox Series X, that the uh, compression algorithms they've got, the uh, decompression would take around 5 of their Zen 2 cores. So, essentially, this is very similar, but Sony's solution is faster than Microsoft's. And so here, if data is super compressible, 
Read speeds can be even faster, way over 10 gigabytes per second. It could be up to 20, apparently, according to Sony, which is insane. It is nuts. It is crazy. It is really fast. But, okay, what happens when you fill up your SSD? And this was definitely a problem that we could foresee coming with both consoles. Currently, um, there are still some questions we have remaining regarding this because they haven't actually given all of the info and the same thing could also be said for Xbox. So with Xbox, as you are most likely aware, there's an expandable card solution that you basically plonk into the back of the system. But they haven't given any insight into like costs per terabyte, for example. With the PlayStation 5, well, you can utilize NVMe drives. The problem is, currently, any PCIe free device NVMe drive is just inadequate. It's way too slow. So you're going to need a PCIe 4 drive, one of the later ones. And Sony themselves are going to need to validate that the drive is capable of it. And this also comes down to the priority system as well. Basically, consumer drives for PC have two priority levels. Um, whereas the PlayStation 5 can have up to six priority levels. So there needs to be some type of translation, essentially, I'm simplifying it for now, uh, between the uh, six and two priority levels, which means that you will actually need some overhead with the drive. So you will definitely need to hold off from purchasing a drive and make sure that Sony themselves are like, yup, that works. Because not only do you need to worry about the drive itself being fast enough, but also size matters, to be honest. And quite frankly, a lot of uh, PC drives uh, will have huge heat sinks, like massive heat sinks, or they'll outfit it with a fan or, you know, whatever else. And obviously that is not, uh, well, going to work. So the first thing I want to discuss is the 3D engine, 3D audio engine, excuse me. Uh, this is known as Tempest Engine. And I'm going to discuss this fairly briefly here, but quite frankly, I will be going much deeper into this, most likely into its own video. Because this tech is, well, I can only describe it as super duper cool. For some time, we've known that audio has not been a big priority when it comes to games. And I think some of this even started on PC back in the days of Windows Vista. I've gone into this extensively before, but basically... Uh, back in the days, and now I sound like I'm 100, PCs used to have dedicated sound cards as a matter of course. If you had a even semi-decent PC gaming rig, you would have, of course, a pretty decent uh, sound card. And Sound Blaster were synonymous with gaming at the time. So if you had your GeForce, your Voodoo, or whatever, yep, you guessed it, you would have a sound card to match. But that certainly changed, and it also, of course, started to change on consoles as well. An awful lot of CPU for the Xbox 360, for example, was dedicated to audio. And the same thing for uh, the current, current generation systems. They are capable, of course, of 7.1, for example, but it can eat up a lot of resources for the system. Microsoft have been pushing its own solution, and, well, now Sony do as well with a bespoke unit, uh, once again called the Tempest Engine. And according to Mark Cerny, it's capable of 50 uh, sound sources. And according to Mark Cerny, it's capable of dealing with hundreds of sound sources at much higher quality than what we saw from the previous generation. This means you won't even need a particularly incredible uh, set of headphones. A fairly decent stereo pair will do pretty well, thanks to HRTF. The problem is with the technology, everyone's ears and the way they hear sounds and whatever else slightly differs. So Sony themselves currently are modeling how hearing works and basically the configuration, I suppose, of over 100 people's uh, ears which has meant that they now have around five presets for launch. I say around because this could, of course, change. So what you would be best to do, of course, is then choose a preset which works best for your hearing. Uh, according to Mark Cerny, I'm going to read this quote for Basin, maybe you'll be sending us a photo of your ear. 
and you'll use a ne- and we'll use excuse me a neural network to pick the closest HRTF in our library, or maybe you'll send a video of our of your ears and head, and we'll make a 3D model, or maybe there'll be some type of uh, audio type of matching game, so you will basically pick the sound which sounds ha uh, best for you. And unfortunately, there are still an awful lot of questions for uh, Sony. And we don't know, of course, the pricing and that type of information. I don't think we're going to learn that until much later on in the year, if I'm honest. I think E3 is a likely-ish candidate for pricing, but I wouldn't honestly be surprised if it's not even later on in the year. But aside from things like pricing then... There is still information like some of the actual physical abilities of the GPU, how um, OS reserves are split for the console, and even what the controller is capable of. We didn't even get a demo of the controller. So then, lots of questions, and it's going to be very exciting for us to cover it. Hopefully you've enjoyed this... um, uh, I was about to call it a shorter video, but um, yeah, uh, I guess we can call it an overview. I think overview sounds pretty good. And then I think the best way of, because of just how much there is to discuss here, I think I'll get the GDC stuff with Microsoft over with. And then after that, I will probably work on a probably component by component basis. Um, I think that's probably about the best way of doing it to compare the systems. So I'll probably start with the CPU and memory in one video because those two are quite easy and short to discuss. And then I'll go into everything else uh, kind of one thing at a time. Oh, and uh, I did also forget to mention backwards compatibility with the PlayStation 4 was, of course, reiterated. But when it comes to PS1, PS2 and PS3, Sony didn't say anything. Interestingly... Jason Schreier from Kutaku seems to believe from his sources that it's not very likely. That's what he said on Twitter. But of course, until we see official confirmation from Sony, we can only wait and see. I can only presume that this is not a hardware issue, particularly emulating PS1 games, as quite frankly, as I keep saying, you could run that on a turnip at this point uh, to do it in software. Instead, I'm guessing it's something more to do with licensing or something or another. I don't honestly know, though. Um, I also go into one final, final, final point, and this is actually Xbox-related. Uh, and I did tackle this in the Xbox video, so you can close out now if you've kind of seen that. But basically, I still keep seeing people reporting that the Xbox Series X is capable of 25 T-flops when ray tracing, and that is not the case. So the Xbox has a 12 T-flop GPU, but when the GPU is ray tracing, um, the BVH calculations, which are essentially the GPU figuring out what geometry is being intersected by what rays of light. I'm keeping this pretty simple for this video. So basically, you have a, a flashlight for the sake of argument. What would that flashlight's beam of light actually intersect? What would it touch? What would it be shining on in that scene? And then furthermore... What objects would the bounces of light from that flashlight then intersect? So, for example, let's say that your flashlight is hitting, I don't know, like a mirrored surface, then it would obviously reflect off the mirrored surface. What would then those secondary bounces touch on? So, obviously, it needs to calculate all of this stuff, and basically, the BVH is for that. So, what essentially Microsoft uh, implied or said actually and they didn't imply it they said is that to run the bvh calculations in real time it would have taken a second gpu that would have been 13 t flops dedicated essentially just for bvh calculation but these rt cores which are part of rdna2 so uh, the next generation in uh, amd gpus will have this as well of course as the playstation 5 you will not be able to, let's say, I don't know, draw a texture with them. So they are incapable of helping on pretty much anything, as far as we know now anyway, um, 
outside of ray tracing capabilities. So if you want to do something like ray trace audio, which of course both next generation consoles can do, great. It can help with that because it's basically calculating what is touching what, and then obviously it can sell, send that stuff over to the appropriate uh, part of the silicon. But you cannot then ask those uh, RT cores to be like, yo, could you uh, draw, could you turn that into a, you know, could you transform that uh, triangle into like a, a square, please? You can't do that. Um, I'm once again making that pretty simple, but I just wanted to touch on it for this video. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, sorry for making it a little bit longer than what I had anticipated. <sighs> but I will let you all go. Thank you very much for all of the recent subscribers and all of the support. If you want to follow my ramblings, then of course subscribe to the channel and uh, ring the bell icon because subscribing is no longer enough, as we all know. You can also fo follow my own personal ramblings as well as the channel ramblings on the appropriate Twitter or uh, Facebook pages, whatever you want to do. And also there are links in to the Amazon affiliate uh, thing, so you could do that if you want to buy something. That would uh, help us out financially, of course. And you can also support us on Patreon if you so desire. Anyway, I think that's just about it for now, so take care of yourselves. Have a great day.